Welcome to the lecture on complications of pregnancy in the first trimester, hyperemesis gravidarum. By definition, hyperemesis gravidarum is severe and excessive nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. It can start an early pregnancy and resolve at the end of the first trimester, or it may persist throughout the pregnancy, making a woman completely miserable throughout her gestation. So what is the cause of hyperemesis gravidarum? It's not really known. It is thought that the elevated HCG levels or the elevated estrogen levels may promote excessive vomiting. It could be a severe reaction to the HCG. It could be a reaction to the fetal proteins that are foreign bodies to this woman. Some have attributed it to a psychological response to a pregnancy that may not be 100% desired. But because of the significance of the vomiting and the multiple problems associated with it, the psychological theory has been refuted in the literature. So why do we worry about hyperemesis gravidarum? Well, because there are numerous adverse outcomes if we don't get a handle on it early and throughout the pregnancy. So your patient may present to the first prenatal visit already very symptomatic and she is dehydrated. She may already have an electrolyte imbalance and what we're particularly worried about is hypokalemia as well as metabolic alkalosis due to vomiting the hydrogen ions from the stomach. Persistent vomiting results in vitamin deficiencies. And once again, we worry about a couple of them in particular. Prolonged thiamine deficiency can cause an encephalopathy. And if we don't treat it and reverse it, there can be some permanence to the symptomology of thiamine deficiency. Low vitamin K levels can develop, and this increases this patient's risk for bleeding. So when you couple the risk for bleeding and severe nausea, she can end up actually having gastric bleeding, esophageal bleeding, develop subconjunctival hemorrhages. There's a variety of ways that this bleeding can be expressed. Now in the long term, there's poor maternal weight gain. And this is not good for the mother because this baby is still taking as many nutrients from her and leaving her depleted. However, because of the poor maternal weight gain, there is also poor fetal weight gain. And this results in low birth weight infant, and this infant is also undernourished. There are significant psychological implications for persistent hyperemesis gravidarum. And this results from feeling so poorly that this woman literally hates being pregnant. And the thought of it of repeating a pregnancy in the future is almost out of the question for fear that she'll have to go through this a second time. She also may look at this baby when it's born and blame this uh, newborn for making her feel so awful. The therapeutic nursing interventions is based on whether or not we're treating this patient as an inpatient or an outpatient. On an inpatient basis, you will see this patient either an antepartum or in the intensive care unit. We begin treatment with IV fluids. We give antiemetics IV, promethazine or metoclopramide, or both are good choices. In the past, we've given Zofran. However, it has been cited in the literature as having the potential to cause adverse outcomes in the fetus. So it remains to be seen if this will still be considered a drug of choice. If the patient is not responding to therapy and is not able to tolerate any type of food intake, she may need to start on TPN. If you have a patient on TPN, she will need a central line, preferably a PIC line. And the nursing interventions associated with a PIC line need to be addressed every shift. The patient needs to be weighed daily, preferably at the same time and on the same scale. 
The nurse needs to monitor fluid and electrolyte balance, in particular paying attention to the potassium, the sodium, the bicarb level. The vitamin levels will only be drawn and monitored on an as-needed basis. Once she starts feeling better, we want to provide frequent small meals with bland foods. We want to avoid foods that have strong odors or that don't look appealing because this is enough to cause nausea to recur. On that note, you as the nurse need to be careful about what you eat because when you smell like onions or garlic or strong spices or fried foods, that's enough to cause your patient to have significant nausea and vomiting. So once again, this patient may be inpatient for a couple of days to a couple of months, then eventually transition to the outpatient setting. When the nausea and vomiting is not significant enough to warrant, warrant admission, then we treat it as an outpatient. So for this patient, we want to teach her about eating frequent small bland meals. We need to have a significant other provide those meals because most women cannot look at food when it's raw, then cook it, then eat it. Discuss the need to avoid drinking with her meals. She can take her fluids in between meals in small sips, and most people can tolerate taking sips every 10 to 15 minutes. Advise the patient to take vitamins and supplements at night so that they are in and out of the stomach by the time she gets up and has to move around throughout her day. Many women with hyperemesis gravidarum need to be placed on medical disability until they are able to tolerate foods and fluids to the point that she is gaining weight and the fetus is growing as expected. This patient all need, also needs much more frequent prenatal visits. We can't wait and see her every four weeks, so we might see her every couple of days, monitor her weight gain, her fluid status, and her vital signs, and the provider will determine on if she's doing okay to continue on outpatient management or if she needs to be admitted. This patient needs a lot of psychological support from everyone, her significant other, all of her friends, the nursing staff, as well as the physicians. She feels so awful that she doesn't want to be pregnant anymore and that produces a lot of guilt. We want to make this pregnancy as good as it can be and so that she will not dislike this baby once it comes into the world. So this ends the lecture on hyperemesis gravidarum. Thanks for listening.